So the last time we looked at several new things, um, eigenvectors and an eigenspace you can define uh, with respect to particular eigenvalues. We looked at uh, geomet the concept of geometric and algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue. We uh, also defined left and right eigenvectors and the principle of biorthogonality, namely that if you take two distinct eigenvalues of a matrix, then any left eigenvector of the matrix uh, corresponding to the first eigenvalue is going to be orthogonal to any right eigenvector of the matrix corresponding to the other eigenvalue. And we also looked at how eigenvectors uh, get changed under a similarity transform. Essentially, the new eigenvectors become S times the old eigenvector. Um, <clears throat> also, we saw that uh, if you take a real symmetric matrix or a complex Hermitian matrix, its eigenvalues are always real. And if you have an operator norm, uh, then uh, for any eigenvalue of the matrix A, uh, mod of lambda is less than or equal to the operator norm of the matrix A. Um, so uh, an immediate consequence of this is that um, if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then mod lambda is less than or equal to max 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n sigma j equal to 1 to n mod a i j and mod lambda is less than or equal to max 1 less than or equal to j less than or equal to n sigma i equal to 1 to n mod a i j. So the mod row sums or the mod row column sums, if, uh, the, if you take the largest of them, they will always be an upper bound on any the, the modulus of any eigenvalue of the matrix. Why is this true? they are L1, L infinity norms of matrix. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that's it. Um, so now we'll continue on. So the next thing I want to discuss is the idea of unitary equivalence. So uh, this is, I mean, just to uh, kind of uh, break the mystery here, um, unitary equivalence or uni unitary similarity refers to similarity under unitary transformations. Remember that two matrices are similar if you, uh, A and B are similar, if you can write B as S inverse AS for any invertible matrix S. But if this S matrix S happens to be a unitary matrix, we say that A and B are unitarily similar or unitarily equivalent. And so basically that's the core idea here. And this unitary equivalence is very closely related to uh, one very important theorem that I'm going to discuss soon, which is called the Shure unitary triangularization theorem. So it forms the basis for such a, for that theorem. And so, um, uh, so this is like the prelude leading up to that theorem. Okay, also recall that um, uh, we say a set of n vectors x1 to xn are orthogonal if the inner product between any pair of vectors is zero uh, as long as you're picking distinct vectors. Um, in addition, if each of those vectors are of unit norm, uh, then we say that they are orthonormal. And when defining these things, we typically uh, only consider the usual inner product xi Hermitian xj and the usual Euclidean norm, which is xi Hermitian xi. And so then under this definition, we say that this vectors form an orthonormal set. Um, also, if um, you're given a set of orthogonal vectors, and the, if these vectors are non-zero, you can obtain an orthonormal set of vectors from this set of orthogonal vectors by simply normalizing each of those vectors. So, for example, if y1, y2 up to yk are orthogonal vectors and they're non-zero, then if I define xi to be yi divided by 
square root of yi Hermitian yi, then these x1, x2 up to xk will form an orthonormal set of vectors. So obviously orthonormal vectors are uh, non-zero by definition. Okay, so we have the following result. An orthonormal set of vectors is linearly independent. This is um, very simple, so I'll just to quickly write this out. So if um, x1 through xk are an orthonormal set of vectors, now we need to show that they are linearly independent. And so suppose um, sigma i equal to 1 to k, alpha i xi equals 0. Then we need to show that all these alpha i's must be equal to 0. So if this is the 0 vector, then we know that this implies sigma i equal to 1 to k, alpha i xi, Hermitian times sigma i equal to 1 to k, alpha i xi is equal to zero. A zero vector in a product with itself will give you zero. And when I expand this in a product, so the left hand side is equal to sigma over i j equal to one to k, alpha i alpha j, xi Hermitian xj. But xi Hermitian xj is equal to zero if i is not equal to j because they are an normal set of vectors. So this is equal to sigma, say, j equal to 1 to k, alpha j, there's a star missing here, alpha j mod square times xi, xj Hermitian xj, which is equal to 1. Um, I'll actually write it out so that it's clear. xj Hermitian xj, and this equals 1. So this means that sigma j equal to 1 to k mod alpha j square equals 0, which is only possible if alpha i equals 0 for or alpha j equals 0, 1 less than or equal to j less than or equal to k. Okay, so which means that x1 to xk are linearly independent. Okay, so now um, we have seen this already, but just for the sake of completeness, um, a unitary matrix is a matrix U in C to the N cross N, such that U Hermitian U is the identity matrix. And uh, at some point we may need this, so I'll make a distinction between complex matrices and real valued matrices by calling the equivalent of this for real valued matrices as a real orthogonal matrix. So these are some uh, abuse of uh, terminology, but um, just this is just for the sake of concreteness when we are using these matrices. So when I say it's real orthogonal, I just mean U transpose U equal to identity and U is a real valued N cross N matrix. Okay, now um, before I state the next result, I want to recall uh, one little property that again we've seen earlier. So if, uh, a is in C to the N cross N and B A equals the identity matrix for some B belonging to C to the N cross N, then 
one. A is non singular. Two. B is unique. And three. A B is also equal to the identity matrix. OK, and so as a consequence, we can write. B equals A inverse. 